Well, it's always difficult to be a, a writer who appeals to children, but Philip Arda has made it a habit, really. Someone who's thought of as a national treasure by the independent uh, in UK, um, the country that Philip comes from. Philip, it's great pleasure to have you with us. Now, Very nice you know, to be here. Thank yes, you. absolutely. But, you know, just look at you. There is this aura about you that says, <laughs> I am so made for children's <laughs> writing. <laughs> Well, I suppose it is an advantage if, if I bound onto a stage. I'm six foot seven, I'm two meters tall, I've got a ridiculously large bushy beard. So that gives me a presence. And what I rather like is people who uh, have never met me but read my books, when they do meet me, say, you sound like your books read. <laughs> and then the other way around. And it surprises them. Well, it does. You see, it's interesting because sometimes people don't inject so much themselves into the voice yes. of the narration, for example. And then people who know me and then read my book say, oh, your books sound just like you. And I think that that's the trick. So the, the big and beardedness comes over in, in the written word as well as when we're having a conversation like this. So that's a great head start with children. Absolutely. So tell us about your work with children and what kind of was the genesis of it uh, you chose because, I mean, when you write, there are so many options. Yes. Well, I think, interestingly, I, I've always written, and I, I always say to children, I've been writing since before I could write. Um, my father used to have these old diaries. Back in the 60s, you didn't have all these glamorous giveaways. People would give you a diary with their logo on the front, and my father got rather a lot of them and would just let them stack up. And to me, they looked like books. They looked fake leather, and they looked fantastic. And I thought, oh, I'd, I'd love to write, write in one of those. But I was too young to know how to write. But I could do squiggles. So I've still got some of them. Some of them are just squiggles, some of them with little drawings, so in my mind I knew what was going on, but they would mean nothing to anyone else. <laughs> and then as time went on, of course, I learnt words and sentences and started writing stories. So I think I had that seed inside me from a very early age. Uh, but I didn't realise, as many people didn't, nowadays it's different. Nowadays, certainly in England, you get authors visiting schools and you get lots of workshops and you can do things online. But when I was growing up, I never really thought that people could make a living out of writing books. Books were sort of there, they happened. They were on the shelf. So um, I ended up being an advertising copywriter in a West End agency in London, advertising fizzy drinks and toilet rolls and cameras and Levi jeans and, and such like. Uh, but I was always interested in, in writing on the side. Uh, but the big moment for me where things really changed was when I started writing for, for one child, my, my nephew, one of my um, wife's sister's boys. And uh, they were based in Moscow. And there was, this was at a time when there were Russian gangsters and things were getting a bit hairy, not in the bearded sense. <laughs> so they sent Ben, my nephew, to school, boarding school in England. And I thought, here's this poor boy at school. I know what I'll do. I'll put aside the non-fiction that I was writing by then for children because I'd managed to get into it through that route because that seemed a more viable career thing. People needed non-fiction books, although I always tried to give them an interesting spin. But I'd put aside time to write letters to my, a letter to my nephew Ben every two weeks. And I wrote it like an adventure story. Mm -hmm. So each letter was an installment. And I'd try and have a cliffhanger ending so he'd want to find out how the hero got out of it. And I called the hero Eddie Dickens after Charles Dickens because, of course, he is famous for writing episodically in magazines in, right. in Victorian times. And I set it in Victorian times. Um, but I only ever wrote it with him in mind so I could think of this one child at school. And then one day through a, a various rather strange situations in which also involved P.D. James, a very famous thriller writer, I got up to speak at a sales conference when she should have been speaking. I was asked to stand at the back of the stage. She did her presentation, then I came forward and I said something like, lucky this isn't live, and people laughed because I said, we can edit this out, it'll all be okay, <laughs> and they laughed some more. And by the end of it, a number of people coming up to me saying, why are you just writing nonfiction? What about fiction? And I have obviously, as I say, from the year dot, been writing stories, but I had kept copies of his letters to my nephew Ben, took them out of a drawer and gave them to them. You kept copies? I kept, I'm no fool. You, you I'm yeah. no fool. You <laughs> see, you, you make your coming. own luck, you make your own luck. Now, I always keep copies of things I write. Okay. I didn't know what I might ever do with it. I thought maybe nothing. Uh, in the same way, I don't throw things away if they don't work. I don't throw them away. I put them aside or keep the file on screen, and one day I may come back to it. But basically, they took my copies of the letters, and they published it. And that book was called Awful End, and it's now in 34 languages wow. and sells all over the world. Excellent. So it was written for one boy. So I wasn't worrying. The first country that bought it was Poland. Now, had I sat down and thought, hmm, now how can I write a book that will appeal, appeal to people in India and Poland and the USA and Germany? you wouldn't know where to start. 
this homogenizing of things where you often see you have an English, because I'm in England, you'll have a, a, an English boy and he'll meet an American girl and then he'll have an adventure. It's so obvious that they're thinking of the American market or thinking of Hollywood. So they're already positioning themselves in their mind, whereas I was purely writing for one particular child. And I think I've carried that with me right. ever since. Yes, but Eddie Dickens took birth and obviously without planning for it yes. really, it became a phenomenon and uh, perhaps you're suggesting in a way that uh, you know when it's not commissioned in a sense Absolutely. to appeal to a global audience there is that much more of you and that much more appeal to the audience at hand but a child audience can be very fickle absolutely and uh, and i think but again that's i think if you try to put yourself too much into the the age group what age am i writing for what market exactly, what am I trying to position? I think you're already creating barriers for yourself as a writer. So did you realize about yourself that you had a natural instinct for writing I for children? I fear that there is. I always say you can't teach someone to write. What you can do is someone who has that spark, that seed in them, you can help nurture it and you can show people tricks, obviously, because the more experience you have, the more you realize. Like you say, don't worry if your first draft is dreadful, but write the story through, because what people are terrible at is they have a great idea for a story and they write it all either in 10 pages or they start and then they, then they give up. What you need to do is finish it because even if it's dreadful, you've then got a complete story that you can then say, actually, if I want this to happen here, I need this happen earlier. And like building blocks, you can move them around and take some blocks out, put new ones in, but you've got a structure to build on. Mm. So you, uh, persevering, doing it, going for it, actually creating something that you can then play around with is very important. But I do believe you do need that seed to begin with. And um, somehow I tapped into, um, my son is only 10 and I've been having books published for over, children's books for over 20 years. So it's not through knowing my nephews and nieces or myself. It's something within me. Perhaps I remember things from my own childhood. Besides the obvious, uh, Philip, what is it about children that you think really works with them when you talk about what they like reading? Well, I think the fantastic thing about children is they are sponges. Children, when they're born, they're not racist, they don't have set ideas. They're there and they can absorb anything around them and they will absorb uh, parents' attitudes, which can lead to conflict things over life, and they may reject them when they're older, but they can take in, and they're not filtering in the way they do. I mean, if you're a child and you're lying on the floor and you can feel the texture of the rug, on your skin and you know that the carpet smells different when it's hotter and it's heated up by the sun and you know what the bottom of the table looks like more than the top of the table because you're using it as a den and you're hiding in it. You can forget those things when you're an adult and maybe the way you rediscover them is when you have children of your own and certainly if you're a father you find it involves a lot of heavy lifting lying on the <laughs> floor and being clambered over. Right. But if you can remember those things, if you can put your yourself in touch with them, you realize that children are essentially interested in anything. They're interested in a, a, an ant crawling over them. They're interested in patterns in clouds. They're interested in smells. They're interested in funny things. So if you can tap into that, and I think you can uh, be much more experimental with children. I wrote a trilogy um, called Unlikely Exploits. And the first one was called The Fall of Fergal. It was set in a very urban landscape. Um, and I wanted it to have a most banal plot, center of the plot, which was a typing competition, because I thought what could be more boring for children than a typing competition? Mm -hmm. And it involves the McNally family going to a typing competition, and um, a boy falls out of the window and is killed in the first paragraph of the book. Uh, so that's the setting there, very urban. The second book, which is called Heir of Mystery, but mm -hmm. spelled H-E-I-R, as in an inheritor of mystery, right. is set in Fishbone Forest, which is a very gothic forest. It's always dark, it's always raining the trees look like fish skeletons. So we've gone from very urban to very gothic. And then the third um, book in the series is called The Rise of the House of McNally. And it's a time travel story. It's all told in the present tense. It's mm -hmm. not told chronologically. You revisit some of the events in the previous books. Some of the characters from the previous books appear in it, but they appear under different names, so you don't know they're the same characters. Now, what adult is going to be prepared to take that on board <laughs> with children. And when I presented the last one to my publishers, they said, "This is oh, this is oh, oh, oh dear, no, oh dear." <laughs> um, I said, "Trust me on this one." And to my editor's credit, she did. And whenever I do events, children will often come up and buy the latest book that I 
might be promoting. But I love it when, as fans, they bring some dog-eared old copies of, of earlier books of mine. And whenever any of them produce The Rise of the House of McNally, I say to them, did you understand that? Did you find that? And they look at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> it, because they trust me. Because I've taken them through the first right. two books yeah. and you're going there, they trust you. And also, with humor, you can deal with very complicated issues. Or you can deal with death. I, I, I dealt with a book that begins, this is a book about death. But because you can be fun, in inverted commas, about something like that, because yes. you know that there will be children who sure. have lost a, a loved one. and things. Sure. So you can't never be flippant or frivolous or sarcastic, but you can still have fun and bring different perspectives. But Philip, like you're saying, you know, children are constantly listening and the world that they live in is evolving so quickly and we find it so difficult to come to terms with you know how can our childhood be lived today mm -hmm. considering the barrage of information the barrage of um, influences that children have today it's uh, radically different from the times that we've grown up as children uh, to cater to their reading needs is it something that you think requires that much more application well I think something that's very interesting and some and, and I can't confirm this but someone told me yesterday it was true in India as well that when um, book sales are falling uh, children's books are still the strongest sale certainly in the UK uh, where there are these austerity measures in inverted commas um, book sales aren't as great as they were but the one strength is children's books now it doesn't matter to me whether a, a book is made from a tree or whether it's on a screen. I personally like a book that I can read, I can see how much is left. When I reread it, a bus ticket falls out and I go, oh, I read that in 1978. I like the stains on it. Every book tells a story. I like to be able to put it on a shelf. But that's because I'm an old fogey. You know, it doesn't matter. What we're talking about is reading. And it's very encouraging that I think that, that parents the world over and children still realize the importance of children's books even if they're sacrificing themselves so I'd say that's a very positive thing to start with in this country you have a fantastic tradition of oral storytelling oh yes that we don't have because um, possibly partly to do with literacy rates and things I think we don't have that equivalent and I think storytellers in England are seen as sort of not quite authors and not quite good enough to write whereas here they're respected tradition and retelling and adaptations and things so you've got that wonderful richness and I think it all boils down to good story I don't play um, computer games but I'm sure computer games that have more of a, a character more of a backstory more of something it's, you're not just shooting and there's more to it than that gains the attention right and I just think and I think stories will exists forever. The day all the batteries run out and the Apple Corporation <laughs> sinks rotten <laughs> into the turn well, to we'll our still, stories. we will still have stories and, right. I, and, and I want to be a part of sharing that. Not only sharing my stories but encouraging children to write their own stories. And the persona that you've created around you with the big beard and <laughs> large of size which of course you had nothing to do <laughs> nothing with but with. there it is you're obviously using it to your advantage. Well yes I mean I, 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 there are some very very attractive um, good-looking authors out there who may flatter their eyelashes and use that but I have I have my height and my beard and all my publicity says big and bearded Philip Harder and when I was 50 and I know you find it hard to believe I'm over 50 but when I was 50 <laughs> no 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 please um, I, I thought well I might shave my beard off and just have a fresh start and all my publishers were so horrified I could hear this <gasps> sharp intake of breath around the world I thought okay no I'm probably stuck with this for life right and you're good to go with it I'm good to go well that's excellent it's great talking to you Peter Harder Philip Arda, with your demeanor, with the entire persona that you've created around you, I'm sure we are looking ahead at many more books and a lot of children very happy watching every move that you make. Thanks indeed for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure.